And welcome in Pressbox and PressboxOnline.com present the Zoom videos. And I'm Stan the Fan from Pressbox. With me playing the part of Gary Stein tonight is my good friend Glenn Clark, the host of Glenn Clark Radio. And joining us is the Chief Revenue Officer for the Major League Lacrosse League and still involved with the Chesapeake Bayhawks. And that is our old friend, Mark Burdett. Mark, how are you? Dan, I'm great. It's great to be with you. Glenn, it's great to be with you as well. It's an exciting time for us, so we're happy to share the good news. So it's uh, great to have a team sport out there and, you know, competing and making some uh, making some content that I think uh, will be really watchable. So we're excited. Mark, this is the 20th year of the Major League Lacrosse. Was it was it deemed by those parties that run the league? Uh, that this was vitally important to put on some type of league this year, no matter what it looked like, because it was the 20th season. So, so sure, I, I think that that's meaningful, and 20th anniversaries, as all anniversaries, are important, and you certainly don't want to have what would be considered a work stoppage or to miss a year. Uh, you become irrelevant quickly when that happens. So. Um, but more importantly, we felt that if, if we were going to continue to grow and compete in this very challenging world that we really can't see where we're going uh, at the end game, we knew we had to put the players on the field and we had to give everybody a chance to watch and consume our product and be relevant for at least a period of time and then be ready to fight for another day. Mark, I was, yeah, I'm sure you thought about various, I mean, when we were all where we all were in March. Yeah. And what you had in mind, I'm sure there are probably a hundred ideas that you guys tossed around. How did we get to this from, from when this all started in March to now knowing July 18th to 26th, right here in Annapolis at Navy Marine Corps Memorial Stadium, how did we get to this being what would become the functional season? So if you, if you back up, Glenn, I think the last time you and I talked, we were really yeah. hopeful that it was going to be a July 4th weekend opportunity. But if you, if you rewind it all the way back to the beginning of the year, and you think to yourself, we're planning a 2020 season. You know, it's going to look a lot, a lot like what 2019 looked like. We're, we're, we're scheduling, you know, 12 games and a championship at a, at a different location. And everybody's traveling. And it's a typical home and away type of environment. And then when COVID hits and you start to think, are we even going to get our products in? We're going to be able to, you know, the manufacturer is going to be able to, to outfit us. And we're thinking about delays. And we're thinking about, well, maybe it's Labor Day. We thought, you know, it would be important that maybe we had some secondary plans, which came and went, to be honest with you. Regular season would have been plan one. Late start, same number of games would have been plan two. Plan three was contracted and then moving in a every two week period from July through September or into Labor Day. And then when moving and travel just was an absolute no-no and you just knew you couldn't protect the players, your staff, and it just, it just wasn't the right thing to do. We realized the only way to do this was to create the bubble, which you know the NBA has gotten a tremendous amount of attention about. And the bubble is truly what has to happen for you to be able to protect players, staff, coaches, referees, everybody that's working. And they all have to be quarantined and be in the same place on a consistent basis and you just got to knock it out and that's what we're going to do we're going to play 18 games in you know nine nine days and uh we're gonna have some tired players i can tell you that i want bird you've been in the, the sports business for and media business for 35 plus years i want to talk to you a little bit about football and baseball yeah given what you just said but let's let's deal with this how did it get determined that annapolis uh, and Navy Marine Corps Stadium was the right place to do this? So great question, Stan. So, so you know, we've had some franchises that have been very well established. Chesapeake's one of them. The Lizards have been great in Long Island. The Boston Cannons have been great. And, and we felt like those, and, and even Denver, the Outlaws have been great. So we had to go to our anchor franchises and say, can you rally the strategic partners and get the government and the actual controlling governments to play ball? And it turned out that Maryland was the most progressive thinking. The Bayhawks had some very strong partnerships in place. And I think that starts with Governor Hogan, yep. who is a Bayhawks fan, has attended Bayhawks games, has been 
you know, positive about the, the sport of lacrosse professionally, collegiate, all the way through to the youth level. So and he came out and his quote was, what better place for professional lacrosse to play than at the home state of Maryland? So that started it. County executive Stuart Pittman fell in place. Uh, Gavin Buckley, the mayor of Annapolis, was all for it. And then you kind of shift to the strategic partners. So you got to have the right venue. And Navy, Navy is the right venue. It's, you know, plug and play. ESPN's familiar with it. They're ready to be there. The facility's right. You have to have a hotel that can accommodate. The Weston's been the team partner for a long time. Fortunately, they're not that busy. And now they're going to be real busy. So that, yeah. that's a good thing. And it's economic uh, impact for everyone. You got to have a health partner in Anne Arundel Medical Center, who has been phenomenal for us. They've been with us the whole way to create the protocol. And then you got to feed everybody, right? We're going to have 900 meals that have got to be served. So, you know, you got to have a catering company that's prepared. And then all the other folks, the tent companies and all those that got to come in line so um, we, we felt we had those relationships. And once we started peeling the onion and hoping that everybody could play ball, it really started to turn. And when it turned, we just went for it. And um, we're here today and we, you know, we are knocking on wood that we can get through the last chapter and, and, and play ball. And, uh, and ESPN is a huge, and, and, and we can talk about media down the road, but a huge part of this whole opportunity for us because we really are going to garner exposure and eyeballs that, that we wouldn't get in, in any other situation. And obviously that's with, you know, no fans in the stands. And so, you know, this is important to have that exposure. And obviously there's nothing else going on um, during this time. Yeah. So it's great to have that. Mark, we've, we've seen a few issues with bubbles already. Yeah. Um, the MLS ran into a problem. They had to send a team home from their bubble. It couldn't participate in the tournament, had to delay games. You guys only have, as you mentioned, a nine-day window in order to yeah. pull this off. Um, what are the plans? What is the thought process for should a problem arise? How do you guys go about handling that? So, Glenn, so we, we, have, we have a protocol in place where all of our players have already been tested. And the results are coming in in a very, I'm going to use the word good, because sometimes positive and negative get construed. So <laughs> sure. In a, very, in a very good manner. So we feel very good about that. They've all been sent a protocol kit, which provides them with glasses, um, you know, mouth covering um, and the right, just reminders of what they need to do. More than 70% of them are gonna drive. So then therefore we're off of planes and trains, which is a really good thing, okay? So they're gonna drive in, park their cars, check in, get credentialed, single player to a room, and they're going to stay in that bubble and anybody that's around them, anybody that, that is any interaction with them will also have followed the same protocol. So we know from the jump that at one point when the clock strikes X, everybody will have been tested and everybody will be cleared. What happens after the bell strikes that time, we will monitor daily. Everybody will take a temperature test. Everybody will, there's doctors on staff at every game, every practice, every post-treatment session, every meal session. So if anybody's feeling out of sorts and, you know, it's going to be hot, so there could be some heat, mm -hmm. um, we're going to be monitoring everybody. And, you know, the first thing is, is they would be quarantined in their room. They might not be able to play for a couple of days just to make sure they're, you know, they're where they are. They would be tested. Uh, Anne Arundel Medical will turn that test immediately and then we'll know, are they positive? Which if they are, they've got to either stay in that hotel room and be quarantined or they get in their car by themselves and they drive home, and then they're home. And I think that gives a player a lot of confidence that maybe he's not going to be stranded, you know, and, and, and left, you know, in a, in a faraway hotel room, mm -hmm. which I think would scare all of us, right? Nobody wants to sign up for that, right? That's, that's not good, you know? Let's do a little bit of a reset, because this is our first time Zooming on, on Facebook Live. I'm Stan the Fan, Glenn Clark of PressBox and PressBoxOnline.com. We're talking to Mark Burdett, longtime president of the Chesapeake Bayhawks. He's now the chief revenue officer of Major League Lacrosse. And Mark, I realize we jumped into conversing because we, the three of us, know what we're talking about. If somebody's watching, can you explain what this is about, what's going to take place from July 18th to July 26th? at Navy Marine Corps Stadium. And then we'll talk about a couple other sports issues. Yeah, so, so Major League Lacrosse is the first professional outdoor lacrosse league, 20 year celebration of this anniversary. 
we're basically contracting the 2020 schedule into an 18 game tournament and uh, we're going to crown a champion and we're going to create a lot of content and we're going to have um, 150 players uh, run their legs off and play a great, great game of lacrosse and, uh, and create a lot of fun. And I think viewers for ESPN are going to really enjoy it. So that that's it in a nutshell. <clears throat> that's a quick nutshell. Glenn, go ahead. <laughs> Well, and I think that you alluded to the ESPN part of this, and I know that, that, that I guess that there isn't a finalized schedule yet, but there are going to be games on not just ESPN2, but also every game would also involve being on ESPN+. Plus. There will be media exposure for every game as part of this, correct? Yes, that's absolutely correct. And so, so at this point in time, you know, ESPN is watching professional baseball. They're watching the NBA. I mean, they're kind of trying to, they're like the fishmonger. They don't know what they're selling. They're, they're just figuring it out. Right. And so um, we realize that if you're, if you're there and you're producing it at their level of quality, and they have a very strong hand in the, in the level of production here, that they can move it. They can move it from ESPN plus to ESPN two. They can put it on ESPN news. They can slice it and dice it and run it. in you know, Scott, Scott's late night show, they can move it up to, you know, the mothership. So it's one of those scenarios where if you're there, you're packaged, you're playing and you're ready, they may very well shuffle the deck and move you around or give you double exposure or give you, you know, a, a late night um, delayed feed. So we just knew that with them in place and with the quality of the production, the venue supporting that quality production, that we're going to do it. And where it, where it actually gets fed to you is going to be determined kind of on the fly. I mean, not on the fly fly, but, you know, 24 hours in advance, 48 hours in advance. So we know right now we have a minimum of three analog games on ESPN2. Uh, there's conversation about a ABC's got a window that they need to fill, believe it or not. Um, who knows? You know, we're, we're just going to go for it. And we've got great guys. We've got great announcers, you know, Joe, Joe Beninati and, you know, Quint and all the guys that you're used to seeing at the top level across. Yeah, I, I don't know about that Corrigan fellow, though. I got yeah, some you know, I, mean, <laughs> I got some. You just I have to maybe turn the sound down on that, on that one. Man. You know, <laughs> so, so the reality is, is they know the game. They yep. know the players. They can adapt quickly. I mean, Saturday when we kick off, we're going to do a triple header. Yeah, uh, you know they're going to be working it, man. That's that's pretty exciting. It's almost like March Madness, and everybody loves tournaments, right? I mean that that kind of creates its own energy. So, and I want to, as a longtime sports executive, you worked for the Ravens for a while, you worked for the Redskins, and you've worked with the Bayhawks, and now in the position in helping to run this league, the Major League Lacrosse entity. I wanted your opinion. Uh, some baseball people are critical of baseball for one major reason that they haven't created a bubble that they're trying to accomplish what they're trying to accomplish in 30 stadiums rather than making even three hubs, one on the West coast, one in central, one on the East coast, maybe Washington and Baltimore, uh, St. Louis and Kansas city, San Diego and San Francisco, something like that. What's your opinion on the, the likelihood that baseball can accomplish what they're trying to accomplish right now. Well, look, I don't, I don't want to be disparaging to anyone. So, yep. you know, I'm an Orioles and Nats fan. And, you know, I mean, I want baseball every night like everybody does. So the, the reality is, is, that, you know, they've got such a deep seated history that I think they get dictated by that history so often time mm -hmm. that it's hard for them to imagine not playing at Camden Yards or not being ever in Camden Yards, even to, even for uh, a new training camp. So I just think that steep tradition has kind of driven them to want to go back to their homes, mm -hmm. get prepared, and then to travel. And there's a lot of unknowns in that travel. I just, I, I really, uh, they have the wherewithal to do it, right? I mean, you know, we're a small league. We don't have the wherewithal to line up five charter buses and a sure. charter airplane and all that stuff. So that was never going to happen for us. But for them, you know, I, I think if they're diligent and they're they're focused on the player's safety first and foremost, I think they can they can pull it off. That there's going to be some people that are going to test positive. It's happening everywhere in our society. We're seeing it all the time. Doesn't mean they go to the hospital. Doesn't mean they're they're deathly ill. It just means they need to step out. Yeah. And um, I don't think there's anything wrong with stepping out. I mean, some of these some of these veteran players are stepping out there, uh, you know, before they even started to say. 
not for me. Yeah. Um, but you know, all that fighting over money and you know, that, 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 that I, didn't look good. It didn't and, look and, good. It wasn't a good look. I got another question for you yeah. and then, then I'll let Glenn ask a couple more. Uh, Steve Bashotti today, as far as I know, Glenn became the first NFL owner proactively to say, Hey, any money that you've put up for season tickets for 2020, you can defer it to 2021. Mm -hmm. And we are trying to look at a model that's going to allow for a roughly about 14,000 fans at games, socially distanced appropriately. Um, your thoughts on what the Ravens proactively announced today. And then if you want to be one of the people that buys a ticket to those games, if you're a PSL holder, you got to get in line to try and buy some. I'm sure they'll juggle it that everybody might get two games or something like that. Uh, your thoughts, though, on Steve Bichotti being right at the forefront of this? Well, as you know, Stan, Steve has always been a very, very good leader and very forthright and always been very upfront and always concerned about the fan. So now you've removed the doubt and the uncertainty of their investment. Their money's safe, right? So then the, the, all that anxiety of, am I going to get ripped off? Am I not going to, am I going to pay and not be able to go? I mean, what am I doing? Do I even want to go? So that's off the table now. So everything else now is kind of bonus, Right. So you can either go at your choice, not go watch on TV, still have your PSL, still have your money safe or bring your money back, use it elsewhere, pay your bills, what you need to do. So I think, again, he's he's taken the, the he's put himself in the seat of the fan and he's asked himself, what are their fears? What are their anxieties and how can they feel closer to the team through this for these challenging times? And that's the smartest thing you can do is yeah. just remove all that. Time and treasure is what they are basically controlling. And if you basically say your time is valuable and your treasure is yours, that, that's smart. And I, I would right. I would suspect, look, nobody in the NFL does anything by themselves, right? It's yeah. always going to be, you know, a concerted effort. So I'm sure, you know, either he decided I'll be the first one out or they decided, you know, you guys are more organized today. So you, you lead the charge. But I'm sure all of them are going to fall in line because that's the way they operate, which is why they are a really good league because they're in, they're together in their decision-making. Thank you. Mark, for two, to thank you for two thoughtful answers to those questions about baseball and football. Glenn Gard. Well, I, and let me, let me spin off of that. Cause I wanted to ask you something about the idea of, of fans at games and, and how many of your guys, I, I'm just going to throw something out, Mark. I fear that some of the delay that we see in getting uh sports at this point happening is that there's still a desire to have some amount of fan participation attendance at stadiums and it it has felt to me like the moment that you can just say hey look we know we, we can't mess around with it so there's just not going to be fans here then you can almost move quicker to figuring out what it is that you're doing so my question is sort of how many of your guys ideas that we talked about earlier involved maybe trying to figure out a way where could we go where fans might be allowed to be in certain states that were a little, little looser in their restrictions yeah. and did it help at all to accept hey look we just have to understand for this year we're doing this without fans did that help get us to finally having the actual season in play yeah you know we touched on this earlier uh, when we spoke and our, our our greatest challenge you know going into 2020 was how do we grow our audience? How do we grow our fan base? How do we sell more tickets? I mean, that is, that is yeah. the ethos of every, every sport college and professional is butts and seats. Cause that's, that's revenue. And it's also brand and, and, and um, fan experience. Well, our, our liability became our greatest advantage because we had the smallest crowd. We were giving up the smallest gate. We sure. were the ones that could look past that and say, it's not, 80% of what we do when you look at Georgia football or Alabama, I mean, it, that's what they do, right? I mean, that's, that's their, that's their, the nectar of what they have. So unfortunately we don't have 20,000 fans or 40,000 fans or 80,000 fans. We have 3000 fans. So we can get past that. And, and that's why it was critical to move quickly to be nimble and, and to accept that reality and say, we'll live to fight another day. We're going to give it to the fans through their television and we're going to find the passive and not even aware fan 
by having some exposure we wouldn't normally get and super serve our passionate fan because they know how to find us and they will. Mark Burkett is our guest. He's Chief Revenue Officer for the MLL. Mark, before we let you go, I wanted to ask you a question. You have, in, a, in essence, the league has gotten kind of punched in the gut for two straight seasons. You had Paul Rabel's league debut last year, the PLL, mm -hmm. uh, and this year you get the pandemic. Where do you think the, the league is in terms of, in terms of its solvency and moving forward and trying to, to still grow the, the major league lacrosse league. So if I could step back just a second and give you a couple of things to think about. So 50% of the players that play in the MLL play in the NLL, the indoor league. Okay. So if you play in the NLL and you play in the MLL, you can pretty much make a living being a professional lacrosse player. Okay. Now you can't play in the outdoor PLL and you can't play in the MLL because we're at the same time and we're, you know, we're, we're, we're competing. Right. But the truth is, is that they had an idea that a traveling show would work because it would expose them to new markets. They're in Salt Lake right. for their tournament. We've been community-based and we believe community-based is how you, how you win in the long run. Right. I mean, the name on the front of the Jersey lasts a lot longer than the name on the back. Right. So, um, Truthfully, there's not enough room today in lacrosse for three separate organizations competing for players, fighting over endemic, you know, advertising and sponsors, trying to have enough of a threshold to bring in non endemics the Budweiser's and the Ford's and the whatnot. So if you stay in the game, hopefully you can come together and you can find a way to be united in a bigger, better and a true entity that's good for the leading all of lacrosse. You know, Stan, you and I had the opportunity, and Glenn, I, I would imagine you did too, but I worked for Art Modell, and you had a lot of time around him. Yep. And the stories he would tell of the AFL and the NFL's merger, and what he personally did, but what it took to bring them together, and then what came of that, is epic, right? I mean, the story's been written for the last 50 years. So, you know, can you be part of a conversation like that? Can you have a seat at a table like that? I, I think you can. And I'm certainly hopeful for it because I, I don't think what Rabel represents or what the PLL is doing is anything but good for lacrosse. Yeah. It's just we're cutting up a small pie. And, and really what we need to do is grow a bigger pie. Glenn, you got one. Need to do. You got Mark, one last one for Mark. Mark, I just wanted to give you a chance to talk up what people are going to see from July 18th to the 26th. Yeah. And obviously, in, in addition to yeah. uh, having been one of the great franchises just for longevity, the Bayhawks have obviously also been very good on the field as yeah. well. So, so, so we'll honor the 2019 Bayhawks. As a matter of fact, we've got it scheduled for Sunday after their game. So we'll, we'll have all, if not most, of the in 2019 team there. Uh, you know, Brendan Kelly, the previous owner and, you know, friend of the league, and Dave Cottle, the head coach, who was – won a number of these championships, but I think you're going to see a amazing commitment to the game. You know, I said earlier today that, that we've never really had this kind of a collegial environment where you've got all these people living and playing and training and, and, and working and eating together. Normally you fly in, you play a game. Hey, how you doing? Hot five. See you later. You're gone. Not a lot of fellowship. And I think we're going to walk out of this with more fellowship and more belief in the professional game of lacrosse than we ever had because of the tightness of the confines and the way it's going to come together. So I think you're going to see tremendous competition. And I think these guys are going to really work hard because they're only there for that purpose and for the love of the game. Nobody's getting rich on, you know, these 18 games. We're all doing it to live to fight another day for the better opportunity down the road and to celebrate the game that we have today, give them a chance to play and crown a champion and, and, and keep it going. That's the, that's the kind of the, 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 the essence of what we're doing. He is Mark Burdett, again, chief revenue officer of the MLL. They are going to play a week long tournament from July 18th to 26th at Navy Marine Corps stadium. You can watch all the games on ESPN and their different ESPN uh, iterations, all right? Thank you very much, Mark. Well said, Stan. Glenn, appreciate your joining us tonight as well. You can listen I'm, to the... I'm still getting Gary's, I'm still getting Gary's check, right? Like that's still, yeah, yeah, right? It, that checks uh, in the mail, yeah. Better be.
Don't spend it all in one place. The Glenn Clark Radio Show has been on through the entire pandemic. He and Kyle Ottenheimer do a great job every Monday through Friday from 10 to 12. Mark Burdett, always a pleasure to talk to you. Yeah. And we'll talk again soon. Thank you for tuning in. For Pressbox and PressboxOnline.com, I'm Stan Charles, and we are out of here.